God of second chances and just the symbolism of coming up clean and fresh out of this water and deciding, you know what, I'm going to do what I think God wants me to do, done with what I think I want me to do and what other people think that, you know, that I should do. I want to do what God wants me to do. So um, just the beauty of um, the power of baptism and making that choice for the Lord. Um, th another thing I wanted to do, this song that we're about to sing, it's called Graves Into Gardens. I think you can probably recognize um, what that means, the idea that God takes things and turns them into good things. And I wanted to read this to you, just a little, oh, I don't have my glasses on, but we're going to do the best we can do. Um, <laughs> no, I don't know, what are they? Are they what, what's, your, what's your reader um, strength? Okay, okay, no. <laughs> Um, so this is a bit the backstory about the people who did develop. Uh, Graves into Gardens is a testimony song to the power and authority of our God. It's a song that very confidently declares how faithful he is to each of us. Um, and then it talks about um, the actual biblical reference. Um, this one came from one of their sermons, but the mystery of potential was the name of that um, sermon. I love that, the mystery of potential. And it says, Elisha still um, had resurrection, a resurrection miracle left in his bones. So a couple of things here. So the story is um, out of 2 Kings, and it says two Israelites were near Elisha's gravesite, and they were about to bury another man. And when they saw a band of enemy raiders coming across, uh, they threw, this threw the man's into Elisha's grave, into his tomb. But as soon as the dead man's body touched Elisha's bones, that man came to life and stood to his feet. So, <laughs> so that's from 2 Kings. So uh, besides the obvious miracle that God does turn, um, you know, a dead man's bone into a standing man's bones, um, just the idea for me, I think, wow, what kind of a testament did Elisha have that he still had so much of God in him, even when he was dead, that he would bring something dead back to life. So that's the idea of this song, and the idea we want to encourage Matt with this morning, just in the idea of coming um, up out of that water and just having that new life. I mean, he's already been living it and experiencing it, but, and maybe you can think about your own life, maybe your own baptism, reflect on that, and just kind of make a, a new kind of stance again today. Yeah, that's right. That's who I am. That's how I belong in this world. I'm going forward to do the best I can for Christ. So we're going to try this. Um, you can stay seated. If you want to stand at some point, you certainly can. But this is Graves into Gardens. I searched the world.
stand, be standed, <laughs> and go ahead and make your way back to leave with um, Pastor Heather. Just the kids, just the kids, Dan, not you today. <laughs> Amen. Not everybody can leave. Uh, Pastor Heather did throw an incredible party yesterday. Uh, I think she said there was almost 50 people there, and uh, I got to come, had to leave early was really hoping for hot dogs and cotton candy. And just as I left, Pastor Heather said, well, let's go and have a hot dog and some... So I missed it. But anyway, thank you, Pastor Heather, uh, for that. Let's take a moment and pray. I want to pray while we're still kind of thinking about that song. <sighs> Heavenly Father, help us uh, right now to um, just to think about you, to really think about the words there's nothing better than you. And as I think about that, I think about Jesus' words where he says, what good is it if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? And so, Father, I just would pray that you'd help us to recognize in really the ultimate sense, there's nothing better than you. There, there is no relationship that we could have that's better than you. There is no amount of money, there is no amount of prestige, there is no amount of power, uh, nothing can replace that which you've planned for us from the very beginning, and that is that we would be in relationship with you. You've created us in your image, and you want to be in relationship with us, and so I pray that we would remember in a very significant way, I think in church we say a lot of words and um, we generally believe them to be true, but Father, I pray that we would know at the depths of who we are that there really is nothing better than you. And forgive us for those times, and I believe we've probably all thought from time to time that this is better than you. If I, if I could have this, then that's what I really need and want. And uh, Father, we recognize that so often, really ultimately always, we come up empty. So I would pray, Lord, for the person today who is struggling with whatever the situation can be, the might be. In the song, it was about graves and seas and just different struggles. But to understand that whatever it is we're going through, you can help us that there is no problem that you cannot help us to get through. And Father, so often we just want the problem to go away. We want the difficulties uh, to just vanish. Uh, but so often it's we need your power and your presence and your guidance and your wisdom to get through whatever it is we're going through. So I pray for that today for the people who are here and they're just really struggling. And I would pray too, Father, ultimately that you would help us to live in the reality that nothing is better than you 
and that it would actually show up in the lives that we live, that we would believe it so much that it would show up in our life every day. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody today. This is a special day for us. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody online. I'd like to apologize to our uh, media person, Justin Roberts, who strives every day to make this perfect. And I set up the baptistry backwards, so uh, we're not going to be able to see Matt's head very well, but you people here will. So for those online, I'm sorry about that, and uh, hopefully maybe one day you can come to see us again in person. But we're excited about that. Just wanted to mention uh, a few announcements. Um, In, I think there may be some um, pamphlets or whatever you would call this, announcements in your pew. But we have started our uh, next cycle of uh, life groups. So on Wednesday here, we have a a ladies group that meets in um, in the fellowship hall. We have children's groups. We have youth group. Um, Our young adults meet. What day do you guys meet? Wednesday at the McCartney's. Um, So they, I guess, have an awesome group. Um, The men's group meets at 7 My Way is the name of the street in Lincoln University. That's at Joey McGarvey's house. So um, a lot of things going on. If you have any questions, contact the church office. Um, And let me make one announcement coming up. June the 13th, we are having an all-church gathering And it's going to surround um, the idea of a soccer game. So it's at 1 o'clock. Now let me just say this. An all-church gathering. Now everybody does not need to play soccer. Now I'm excited I am going to play. I mean, I am. But I'm a little bit like a hockey player. I think i got about 90 seconds of good running in me, and then the new shift needs to come in or whatever. But let me just say this. We would love it to get together. It's just, you know, even in church today, you might look around and think, you know what, I don't know half the people here. And I'm not saying, oh, you come here, you got to introduce yourself to every person there, but it just was going to be fun to kind of come together. And I pray that even if you're not, a, you know, you're not in shape like me, you don't play soccer like me, those kind of things, don't let that throw you off. It was interesting. Pastor Heather challenged me to go down the slide at the children's thing the other day. So I was thinking... I want to do this, but I thought maybe I needed to be invited. So she kind of, whatever. I'm going down the slide. Well, apparently my weight kept the slide from staying an angle. And so all of a sudden it kind of creased in the middle and all these kids were banging up behind me, you know, that kind of thing. But so please come. Even if you can only run around for 10 seconds, it doesn't matter. Or if you just want to watch. But um, we're going to start there at 1. So if you want to go to the park and take something and eat there, you can or whatever. But it's just, hopefully it's just a time of fun together. So we're going to play, and you don't have to be good. Soccer's pretty simple. You take the, I mean, it's simple and complex at the same time, but the simple part of it is you just shoot the ball towards the goal, and um, if the people you're playing with are smaller than you, you just push them. But anyway, so please do that if you can, or just if you watch. Just like in the old days, we used to go watch people play softball, that kind of thing. It's just, um, it's soccer because I can't see the ball anymore, so I wanted something I could do. All right. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Luke 15, that's kind of going to be where we're looking. And um, but I want to talk about this idea here of, uh, anyway, this idea of we had to celebrate. Now, uh, the name of the message is not because my birthday is today. Um, sometimes people, for fun and love, they throw big parties for the people they love. And I told Carrie, please don't ever throw me a big party. And I'm being serious. Don't ever throw me a big party. I, but some people are real party people. And as I was thinking about celebrating, I was thinking, like we're, we're like the anti-McCartney's or the anti-Smiths. Like the Smiths up here. They, they're, they're party people. Like Matt's getting baptized, let's throw a party. You know what I mean? Matt got some new shoes, let's throw a party. You know, Caden put brakes on his truck, let's throw a party. You know, whatever it is, it's just, let, they like to celebrate. Um, not so much in the family that I grew up in. We weren't big celebrators. But if anything needs to be celebrated, it's the idea of somebody coming to faith. And so we're excited. When I talked to Matt the first time, he was talking to me about, um, and we had sang a song in church about the idea of, of dying and then being raised in Christ. And I just thought, that, that's such an incredible thing. So we're going to have a baptism later. 
So I wanted to talk about this idea of celebrating, particularly as we see this in Luke chapter 15. Um, and it's interesting, Luke chapter 15 has three stories about things that are lost and that are found and the celebration that happens when things are found. But at the beginning of the chapter, it starts out like this. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners, this is New uh, uh, Living Translation, the tax collectors and other notorious sinners came to listen to Jesus teach. And I think it's interesting when we think about this idea, we read about kind of verses like this in the Bible, and sometimes we just read past it like it's not a big deal. But imagine this, God's son, Jesus said to his disciples, they said, show us the Father. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So here is Jesus representing the Father, and people are coming to see him. And not good people or not righteous people like we would think, like the Pharisees and the scribes, but like Luke talks about, tax collectors and notorious sinners. They're flocking to Jesus. And I find that to be very, very interesting. Because we tend to think that sinners, or let's say non-church people and church folk, they, they just don't get along. But it's interesting how Jesus um, connected with people who, um, people like the ones described here in Luke chapter 15. But then look at the contrast with the Pharisees. So these people are coming to hear Jesus, but as Luke says this, but the Pharisees, these people that were very, very well respected by the Jewish people, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That disgusted them. They didn't like the idea. The sacred and the secular are not to meet or to match or anything like that. So it's a very interesting tension that we see in the scriptures and that really we face in our own lives, this idea that people came to Jesus. There was something about Jesus. And I think one of the things is, is that he knew what he believed, he lived what he believed, and people understood when they listened to him that his words had authority. And so one of the things that's so important for us is that our words are matched by the lives that we live. It's so easy to talk about God in one statement and then live unlike God you know in our normal lives and so I think we have no authority with people but so it's very interesting we've been having clicker problems all all morning but Matt could you kind of advance me here's what Jesus said even though the the people of Jesus day had great respect for the Pharisees this is what Jesus had to say about them He said, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom. I mean, they look great on the outside, but if who you are on the inside isn't different than them, you'll not inherit the kingdom. So there's this great, interesting tension here where the religious community didn't like the fact that Jesus uh, connected with sinners and and, uh, tax collectors but they flocked to Jesus. Um, So I'm going to read Matthew, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 15. And this is my birthday Bible. So um, I want to read from it. But um, so Luke chapter 15, here's what Jesus says. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he leave, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, goes home, then calls his friends and his neighbors together and say, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And again, so Jesus is telling this story. Again, there's this tension. These sinners are coming to Jesus, but the Pharisees don't like it. And so Jesus begins to tell them this story about what God is like and about God's love and what he thinks about people. He goes on to tell another parable. It's really essentially telling the same um, thing. And then he says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And then in verse 10, 
As Jesus tells the story, he says, In the same way, I tell you that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So as I was thinking about this service today, this idea of somebody's lives being made new, somebody who would die to their old self and be raised to new life, I just was thinking about this passage. And I thought, it's interesting because Jesus is saying, listen, when one lost sinner repents, Heaven rejoices. Heaven rejoices. Now, they don't have the same party issues I have. Heaven thinks, you know what, this is the ultimate, that somebody would come to faith, that somebody would come to realize that nothing is better than God. Nothing. And so for so many people, I think they... They just have a hard time really understanding what it means to be in relationship with God. So often we connect it so much to the church, and and we think, yeah, it's good, but it's not really that good. And, man, I've been to church, and people hurt my feelings in church and all these things. But it's this ultimate idea when people come to the understanding that God loves them, and he extends his love to them, and when they accept it, nothing is worth more rejoicing than that. Nothing. Nothing. And so while I, where I have a hard time celebrating certain things, um, this is not something I have a hard time celebrating. It's this idea that God loves us and reaches out to us, and when we accept it, you know, nothing uh, beats that. So I want to kind of talk about this for a minute as we think about Jesus and the difference that he had with the Pharisees. To the Pharisees, these people were sinners, And so they didn't like him. They didn't like the fact that Jesus was with them. He was supposed to be a a great religious man. They didn't like it. But to Jesus, they were lost people that God loved. To the Pharisees, they were just sinners. To Jesus, they were lost people that God loved. Have you ever thought about how God thinks about you? How does God think about you? Now, I've grown up in the church my whole life. Some of you may be the same way. Some of you maybe not. But I felt like I grew up in a, in a great church. I felt like they taught the Bible. I felt like even in my home, we had a good understanding, and it was talked about. Things about God were talked about. But I always got this feeling that God was against me and not for me. Now, I could avoid him being against me by believing in Jesus, or by doing certain things, but something about this whole thing almost made me sense, even though the church didn't teach that, that God was somehow against me. And let me just say, God is not against us. God is not against us. God has our best at heart. But our be- Now, we look at that and say, God, if you have my best at heart, then you give me what I want. But what we want is not always what's best. I mean, surely we get that. Surely we understand that. And so, but have you ever thought really what God thinks about you? Now, I want to talk about what does it mean for a person to be lost. And um, in the church, we use words like lost and saved. Somebody is lost or somebody is saved. Maybe you're familiar with those words. Maybe you're not. But I grew up, I'm very familiar with this idea of lost. If you're lost, you go to hell. If you're saved, you go to heaven. So I'm very familiar with that, and so I grew up with language like that, and again, I grew up with the idea that if you're lost, God's sending you to hell, and it was like that's where he wanted me to go, but what does it mean for a person to be lost? So I want to think about this idea of lostness for a minute. Something that is lost is something that is not where it is supposed to be. Something that is lost is something that is not where it's supposed to be. It can still be great. Carrie told me the other day, she said, I was getting in my, digging in my thing. I found your second key to your, to the church card. I'm thinking, oh, thank you. I was, I kept being, waiting for me to lose my second key. And I thought, that's going to be a great conversation with the church board. Yeah, I lost both keys to the church car. Um, Yeah, it's going to cost about $250 to replace them. I just remember, but, but the key that I lost was still a great key. But as long as it was someplace that I didn't know about, even though it was a great key, it didn't do me any good. 
And so something that is lost, so if a person is lost, it's not, the person is not where they're supposed to be. Well, where is the person supposed to be? Well, God created us in his image so that we could be in relationship with him. So that's where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be in relationship with the God of the universe. And again, for so many of us, we kind of look at that and it's like, well, what does that mean? Well, if I think about a relationship, if I think about an ultimate relationship, if I think about my relationship with Carrie, what I want that relationship to be. Well, I want it to be far more than we just kind of hang out once in a while together or occasionally we go out on a date together. It's like I have great expectations for that relationship, that I would love her with all my heart, that she would love me, that she would do nice things for me, that I would do nice things for her, that we would be on one another's side. I have great expectations for my relationship. But so often with God, we have so very small relationship. As a matter of fact, we just think, uh, God, if you can make sure I go to heaven... That would be awesome. I'll handle the rest on my own. I'll handle the rest on my own. That's not a fulfilling relationship. God, Jesus says, this is eternal life. I grew up thinking eternal life was heaven. Hell, heaven. Eternal life, heaven. Here's what Jesus says. This is eternal life, that you would know God and Jesus Christ, the one he sent. Because if you know him... Then when you die, you go to heaven. So something that is lost is is is, uh, something that is lost is something that is not where it is supposed to be. So where are we supposed to be? Again, we're supposed to be in relationship with the Lord. The condition of lostness. Now listen very closely to this. I think it's important. Maybe it's just important to me. But the condition of lostness is not the same as the outcome to which it leads. The condition of lostness is not the same as the outcome to which it leads, which would be the idea of hell, or would be hell. Excuse me. We are not lost because we're going to end up in the wrong place. I hear people talking a lot in church circles. Somebody is sick. Are they safe? Or are they lost? Are they lost? That means they're going to hell. Are they saved? That means they're going to heaven. And so it's that language. Are they saved or are they lost? And it's, we don't generally look at what kind of relationship the person has with God. We just want to know, well, what do they think of themselves? Do they think of themselves as saved or lost? So I want to just think again about terms and how we think about God and how we think about our relationship with him. And if you think about God, am I saved or am I lost? And that's your primary idea. I think you're missing a huge, big piece of this. You're missing a huge, big piece of it. And it's, I remember growing up, and I had a neighbor named Mikey Dean. Mikey Dean lost his mom and his dad early in life. Well, Mikey Dean lived with his, uh, his grandparents, but he had everything I didn't. He had a nice bike. He had a motorcycle. He had everything I didn't. Now, Mikey Dean and I used to get along good, and sometimes we didn't get along so well, but I always ultimately ended up loving Mikey Dean because I wanted to drive his motorcycle. And in the winter, I wanted to drive his snowmobile. And when he got a Mini bike, I wanted to ride that, or when he got a, whatever, I, I wanted to be friends with him because I wanted, and, but that's not a relationship. Yet that so often is how we treat God. So let me just read this in its entirety again. The condition of lostness is not the same as the outcome to which it leads. We're not lost because we're going to end up in the wrong place. We are going to end up in the wrong place because we are lost. So again, what is the outcome of lostness? We think about hell. But I want to say this for a minute because I've been having conversations and I've had conversations with people. Hell can be a very difficult concept to connect to a loving God. Hell can be a very difficult... Now, in the church, we're very okay with it. We're very okay with people going to hell. It's just part of the life of them and the language of a church. But when you start talking to people outside the church, it's difficult for them. It's difficult to think that the God of the universe says either love me or go to hell. Because when they think about their own relationship with that kind of dynamic, it doesn't seem right or even healthy. So hell can be a very difficult concept. So I want to talk about it because we're God's representatives to share and and hopefully we can help people understand what all this means. Somebody asked me one time, do we really have free will if choosing against God means choosing eternal damnation? Again, it's the idea 
Well, you either can choose to love me or you can go to hell. Which would you like to do? Nobody would choose hell. And I realize I, this is kind of uncomfortable. At least that's the way your faces are looking. I, I'm not trying to be uncomfortable. I'm trying to say we have focused primarily on hell, but that's not God's focus. God's focus is that we would be in relationship with him. But it seems to me like the church sometimes has focused on hell. And I'll have people tell me, why don't you preach more on hell? Why don't you preach more on hell? Now, I get it. Hell scared me. So when a preacher like me got up and started talking about hell, I was afraid. So they said, if you're afraid, pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. But behind that, there was this sense that God was against me, and I was just somehow getting around it because of Jesus. But God is not against me. And so even this idea of hell, this idea, you can either love me or you can go to hell, that isn't much of a choice. But I don't think that's why God God teaches us about hell. I had a friend, I have a friend. Now, I'm assuming they have not changed their thought, and I've shared this in church before because it just blows me away. But this person told me they were so deeply wounded by somebody. They were completely made fun of at work. This is an adult. And this person told me, if I could kill this person and knew I could get away with it, I would do it without thinking about it. And I'm thinking, wow. I mean, they didn't even bat an eye. If I could kill that person and get away with it, I would do it without thinking about it. And I'm thinking, maybe instead of this idea that God's saying, listen, you can love me or you could go to hell, maybe God is saying, listen, if you choose to do things your own way, if you choose to go your own way, if you choose to be your own God, this is where it ends up. If you choose to be apart from me, ultimately your choice will be honored by God. So hell is not this idea that I'm going to force you into relationship, but just trying to say, listen, this is how things work. And so maybe hell is a a gift of love in the sense that it can be a deterrent for us, where we can really take our life seriously. Because so often, and this is what I realize now that I'm 55 and very wise, that Here's what I know. I have not been very wise. And it's like the greatest gift God could give us is our time. But how often we act like time is not a big deal. But time is a huge deal. And so even with this, this idea, we have this tendency to just think that life is always going to be like it is. It's just like, you know, I tell people, the one thing that really excites me is being 10 10 years away from Medicare. I mean, like when I think about it, I think that's kind of exciting to me. I hope it's true. I think, oh, don't have to worry about paying for insurance. I guess, you know, you got to do certain things. But for me, I'm excited. But it's like, is life so much more than that? But again, so this idea of hell is not God trying to scare us into a relationship, but trying to say, listen, if you choose to do life without me, your choice will be honored. But there is a consequence. There is a consequence. So let me finish with this. I'm going to read this just real quickly. This is what maybe my favorite part of the Bible. But Jesus is telling the story. He already talked about the lost sheep, and if we had a lost sheep, wouldn't we go find it? Of course we would. And heaven is, you know, just like the, the shepherd rejoice, uh, heavens rejoice. So this is now a story about a, a father who lost a son. Jesus tells this. He says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. So at this point, in this story, the son is lost. He's not where he should be, which is with the father, with the family. And so for all of us, for the human condition, it's the idea that we're separated. That's not where we should be. We're lost. But that's not the desire of the Father in this story, nor is it the desire of our Heavenly Father in heaven. God is not happy that anyone would be lost. So Jesus continues. So he's telling this story, and, he's, and he says, After he had spent everything there, there was a famine in the land, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, 
who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. So for just a minute, if you could think about this guy, he's thinking, you know what, Father, give me my money. I'm going to go out and turn my life into something. And he goes out and he wastes all the money and he ends up feeding pigs. And the Bible says, Jesus says in this story, he longed to eat what the pigs were eating. His life had gotten that low. And so even for us, when we are lost, there's a sense of if I have X, Y, or Z, that will do or be what I need in my life. But if, if it isn't God that we're searching for, it always will leave us empty. It always will leave us empty. And again, sometimes you, don't, you have to get older in life where you realize, you know what, all these things I thought would make my life, I have now, and they have not made my life. So Jesus continues, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went on his way back to the father. So as this parallels these other stories, this is the point of repentance for this son. You realize, listen, I've, I've been doing it my own way. I've been my own, you know, making my own rules, doing my own thing, but now I'm repenting and returning to the Father. And then verse 20, and somehow we got to get a hold of this. So he got up, went on his way to the Father, but while he was still a long way off, I imagine rehearsing what he was going to say to his Father. But when he was still a long way off, his Father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And again, think about how you think about God and think about how the world thinks about God. Do they see God as when they would turn to him and start heading back to him, the father would just run to them? I don't think so. I think they see God like the Pharisees. I don't like you. I don't like how you talk. I don't like how you dress. I don't like anything about you. If you will cave to what I want, then I'll approve of you, at least so-and-so, and and then I'll let you go to heaven when you die. But it's nothing like that. The father, as soon as he saw the son, he went out to the son. He's like, now you're where you should be. And so what we're doing today is a celebration of somebody who was lost being found. Now, hopefully, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've had a similar opportunity. Mine was in Clear Lake, where I said, you know what? I'm not the same Larry Powell. God transformed me. He transformed me, and he loves me. And I talk about this a lot because there's a sense where I am retraining myself to think differently about the way God thinks about me. He loves me. He loves you. He loves Matt. But some of us are like the Pharisees, and we think, well, he doesn't love so-and-so. Yes, he does. But God can't help you as long as you're doing your own thing, going your own way. The son was lost to the father, but when the son came to his senses and came back, then the father could welcome him back in his family. I mean, what an incredible truth. But here's what I want us to know. The world isn't going to believe it if we don't believe it. How is the world going to believe it if we don't believe it? So what does the Father think about us? He wants to be in relationship with us. And one of the things, and it's so funny, even as we look at whether it's like hell or other things, sometimes we look at surrender to God as a bad thing. We think, oh, God wants me to, God wants us to surrender because The proverb says in at least two places, there's a way that seems right to us. There's a way that seems right. But in the end, it only leads to death. And again, just like Jesus was saying, suppose one of you had a sheep, how would you respond? It's just like a parent. Suppose you knew your child was making bad choices. Wouldn't you try to get him to make right choices? Of course we would. So just like we would do it, God is like that, but even more so. Like we love our own children, God loves us even so much more. So I want to take a minute and pray. So Matt, if you'll get ready. I'm not going to baptize you with your shoes on. I, I, want, I want to pray for everybody here. I feel very strongly about this because, again, I grew up in the church, and somehow it's still missed that God really loved me. 
Now, I'm imagining maybe somebody watching online or somebody here, maybe they're struggling with that. But again, it isn't just enough that God loves you. The whole baptism symbolism is this. The old life has gone to a new life. God wants us to have a new life. You think, you know what, I listen to you every week. I don't know that your life is that good. Let me tell you something. It is so much better than the way it was. So much better. Yeah, I have been formed in a lot of negative ways, but man, God is reshaping me. And more and more I'm like Jesus, and I'm glad about that. So this is a great celebration. God is not against us because he wants us to live differently. It's not because he's mean and ornery. It's because he knows what's best. So anyway, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I don't, I don't know where we're at. This is an inter- interesting day for me. I feel like for some reason I'm tired. But Father, I think about the fact that you love us. And I think my experience in over 30 years in the church of talking with people, and I think particularly of a person who told me probably about two weeks before he died, it's all been a lie, it's all been a lie. I don't know Jesus, I've just been faking it. Father, help us to understand, help us to get past this concept of lostness being just about, well, if I'm lost, I'm going to hell, if I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and understand that when we're lost, we're not where we should be. And there can be people who are believers here today who aren't maybe where they should be today. Maybe they've been distracted. Maybe they've just thought they had a relationship, so they were just going to go figure life out on their own. I'm not sure. But Father, I would pray today that they would, like the young son in the story, would realize that they're going the wrong way and turn to you knowing that you're waiting for them to turn. And then, Father, I think about the person who maybe has just been trying to figure it out. They think about Jesus, and like Luke chapter 15, verse 1 starts, that people came to Jesus. But then again, there were the Pharisees just off to the side, just talking about him. So, Father, maybe they... Maybe there's somebody here today that's never really understood that you really do love them. That Jesus going to the cross was for them. It was so they could be forgiven. It was so they could have new life. And so, Father, I'm talking to the people who are listening online. I'm talking to the people who are here today. Father, you see them. They see their own heart. They know whether they're lost if they're where they should be. And maybe today you're revealing to them, you know what, that's you. But you can be found. So even now, every every head bowed, every eyes closed, is there anybody that would say, I just want to pray for you because today can be the day that you go from being lost to being found. Is there anybody like that? No pressure. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed, best I can tell. It's nobody else's business. Is there anybody pray like that? Anybody at home? Okay, I see that hand. Is there anybody else? All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you saw that hand. And I know what people are like. I think there are some people here and at home who wanted to raise their hand. It's hard to raise your hand. It's hard to admit you're lost. Somehow we get tricked into thinking that just really trusting in you completely is not the best way to live. But Father, for the person who raised their hand today, for the person who thought about raising their hand, I pray right now in these moments, they would turn. They would repent of doing their own thing, going their own way, and just go back to you knowing that your arms are open for them. Father, we praise you for your love. And thank you for this opportunity to celebrate together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, Matt, we're going to baptize you. So if you'll come on up. Here, if you could help me with the towels, maybe. What's that? Now, I did not 
know Matt real well until he called me up and said, hey, I want to be baptized. And, um, and I, so we met. I said, well, why do you want to be baptized? He had a great story. I have no idea. This, this is huge pressure. I don't know if you're going to be any good or not. But um, why don't you share with us a little bit about what God's doing in your life and why you're here today? Uh, that, that's, okay, good. I'll just hold this for you. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Matthew Nucleus. I'm married into the Smith family, you know, the party family. <laughs> so, um, some backstories. I've never really been a very religious person growing up, and um, I've always tried to make my own way, to make, find my own happiness my own way, and um, using money for temporary happiness or when I had a problem or hard times. And I'd turn back to myself to try to find solutions. And uh, when I couldn't, you know, I'd pick up my problems and carry them with me. This past year, I reached a point where I knew that I can't solve my own problems. And my wife saw that I was struggling, and she bought me a book that's titled, How God Makes Men. I couldn't believe the calm that I felt reading that book. And... I was finally able to find the peace and satisfaction that I've been searching for in God. Mm-hmm. And today, I'm being baptized to symbolize a rebirth, to strip away the person that I used to be by stepping into the waters of faith and having my body and soul cleansed. Amen. I had no idea you were going to do that so well. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have <laughs> preached. <laughs> Um, well, um, Matt, let me, let me just read to you a few things, and I'd like to ha- have you respond. Oh, I guess we still need this. Baptism is a sign and seal of the new covenant of grace, the significant of which is attested by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans, where he says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him, through baptism in death, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, um, through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. The earliest and simplest statement of Christian belief into which you come to be baptized is the Apostles' Creed, which reads as follows, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Christ Jesus, his, one, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Will you be baptized into this faith? If so, answer, I will. I will. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and do you realize that he saves you now? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you obey God's holy will and keep his commandments, walking in them all the days of your life? If so, say, I will. I will. Okay, Matt, if you'll come up. Matthew Ryan Newquist, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, let's celebrate. All right, praise team, come on up. You, you, can, you can head out. You don't have to stand here and do that. But um, let's take a minute and pray together. Oops, sorry about that. Heavenly Father, we were talking in our board meeting the other day about the culture of our church. And Father, I pray that you would help us to long for this, to see people who are lost be found, to see people who don't understand, they think it's in their best interest to do things their own way, 
but that they will one day find that you love them and that you have a plan and you have strength and power and wisdom for them. Father, encourage us in our hearts. Help us to recognize that it was the power of the Holy Spirit at work in Matt's life. The book was a tool. Addie was an important piece. But Father, you loved him and you reached out to him in your grace. And so, Lord, I would pray that you would do the same for those that we love and care about who are lost. Those who are not where they should be. Those who are made in your image but are not in relationship with you. Father, help us to celebrate as we sing this closing song today. Thank you for what it means to be in the household of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us and let's sing and we'll celebrate this baptism, wonderful celebration today. exit out through the back rows first and we'll sing it out as you go blessed are blessed are the pure in spirit who are torn apart blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart blessed are the people hungry for another start for theirs is the kingdom the kingdom of god and all the people said amen Oh, 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 and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. Once more. And all the people said amen. Oh, 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 oh and all the people said amen. 